Hey there everyone, I'm Steve and welcome back to Retro Tech. Today's episode is all about you, the viewer, and we're going to go through the many questions that I've gotten over the last three weeks. Now, I did get about 20 really good questions and I'm planning on going through 10 in this video and then later in the week we'll release a part two and we'll have the other 10 questions and we'll both have some good answers in them. So first off, you'll notice today we're inside, not in the shop anymore. This is actually my bedroom. And the reason we're in here is for our first question of the day. The first question comes from Patreon. It's from Sam. And Sam asked, what is my favorite non-Sony CRT? Well, that is simple. It's this CRT. Now, I've gotten lots of CRTs that aren't Sony's. I've got the JVC-D series. But honestly, after using a lot of different ones, this one's my favorite. It's a Toshiba. And let's just go ahead and take a closer look at the TV and the details. All right, so first let's take a good look at this Toshiba tube television. This is a 32A43 Toshiba Shadow Mask CRT consumer TV. Now on the front here we've got some buttons and then we've got one input for composite video in. And then on the back we're going to have our first look at our label here with just our basic television model information and manufacturer's date. But let's go ahead now and take a look at the input board on this TV and you'll see it's got S-Video and composite ends, but it's also got a blue and red dot there. That's actually called Color Stream at the time. Now in the demo, we're going to use a PS1 console. One of my favorite remade consoles, the PS1 just has a cool little look and is a lot smaller than the original PlayStation 1. Now let's look at it real quick. It's just really tiny and fits well anywhere two controller inputs and then we turn around back and we've got just a simple power input as well as our multi AV in and the uh, buttons on it work really well it's just an all around great unit for the demo today we're going to be playing Diablo and this is a great game for PlayStation 1 uh, just has some really cool cover art and the disc looks great just keep in mind to check those discs if you do buy one of these older, rarer games to make sure it's in great condition because that's the most important thing about these old disc games is the condition. This is a highly rated game and two players, pretty cool for the time. To make sure that I can hook this CRT up with the best possible video quality, I'm gonna use HD RetroVision's cables. And this is their Sega Genesis 2 cable. It's just really high quality and very nicely made, works perfectly, converts the RGB into a component signal for a CRT. And all I needed was this small adapter they made, this is for the PlayStation 1, and it connects to the end of this Genesis 2 cable, and now you have a component cable for the PlayStation 1. And it fits in very nicely to the AV multi-out on the back of the console. Now, this CRT does have a color stream, input but that just means it's component input so you put the red and the blue there and then the green actually goes in the yellow in the yellow input it doesn't go and there isn't a green input it has to go there so it's just a simple design of hooking it up like that to get it ready to play okay so i've got the demo set up here and i'm really trying to keep the glare down in the room so it's a little darker for the first couple questions, we're going to sit here. I'm just going to let it play. I'll go through the questions and we'll get you some answers. Okay, so question number two comes from Ryan on Patreon. And Ryan asks, in your experience, what is the most problematic monitor you've had to encounter and you wouldn't recommend? And I'm kind of glad he asked this because I've not talked about it entirely. But honestly, uh, the BVM A series was the worst CRT I ever had to deal with just because of the rarity of the parts. Not only that, but that was the biggest reason. Now, one of the other problems was the fact that uh, the settings on it are very hard to, and tricky to get right. You know, you've got some very tricky things with sync on that monitor. A couple things just won't even work, even if you have all the right parts. So I definitely tell people, you know, stay away, at least for the time being, stay away from any A-series BVM. And honestly, unless you're really experienced with CRTs and just love them, I tell people unless one just falls into your lap if you're looking for a CRT go for a PVM first or a consumer grade first so you get your feet wet and understand kind of what's going on make sure it's the right choice for you and 
because a BVM has a lot of features and it's really good, but it's like a Ferrari and the Ferrari has to be serviced. You know, it, it's not like a high-end car like a Lexus where you can just, um, you know, use it and use it and take it to be normally serviced, you know, for oil changes or something. But basically, you can't keep the, le the BVM, uh, it needs to be serviced kind of regularly. It uh, needs to have changes made in the setting menus every time you change an input, possibly. So, really confusing piece of machinery there. It takes a patient person. I always say, uh, unless you're really dedicated, don't get a BVM on purpose. Ryan also had another great question, and it is, Hey Steve, when you're making a yoke adjustment, what do you use for epoxy to hold it in place once you've done your yoke adjustments? Um, I used to use two-part epoxy. Now... That's really messy, and I don't feel like it's very good in case you want to go in later and need to make another adjustment or change. So I'm changing that recommendation um, to like a caulk. And you can just get a safe caulk that can go on glass and plastic and just use that instead of the uh, permanent or semi-permanent epoxies that I had been using in the past. Okay, so the rest of the questions are from subscribers on the YouTube channel. And first off, I had some questions about where I'm located. Now, I do have a business location. It's in Gallatin, Tennessee, which is about 30 miles or so outside of Nashville. Not really far from Nashville, but it is a full business location. So if you need some kind of business done with me, um, I can exchange that address. You can either come there in person or mail things there safely. Uh, another thing I got asked is, is it difficult? This came from Detroit Retro Gamer. And they said, is it difficult to take bezels off of PVMs? And the answer is absolutely yes. Unfortunately, that's like the hardest job to do. You have to physically rip down the entire monitor, except for uh, like the 20L5 and 14L5. Those ones, the bezel just comes right off the front. Every other model, they made it where you had to rip the whole monitor apart on Sony to get rid of that, uh, you know, that bezel. To take it off and replace it, it's a, it's a big task. It's got to be completely taken apart. Okay, Bob Rob asks, I love your work as well as your videos. They are very helpful and uh, knowledge-wise. Any advice or book recommendations for a total newbie who would love to someday have fluency in this type of work? I know it's a long road and there's no shortcuts to mastery. I'm reading and watching as much basic info on electronics as I can and just want to know uh, any tips uh, from you along the way and thank you well thank you Bob that's a great uh, question and thank you so much for all the stuff you send there really nice and this is a very great question uh, what I want to say is it is a patience game just take your time first off um, start with something small I recommend getting some older gaming consoles some outdated stuff that's uh, very cheap or maybe even broken to begin with and pull it apart start working on the circuit boards get a basic soldering iron and then try to see and, and develop some techniques with just practicing soldering you can even heat up existing components and try to pull them uh, that's a great way to get experience because then if you damage something you're not really worried about it you can go back and try to fix anything at that point so I would recommend using those things but also you're gonna need to study things so whatever you know, TVs, I always I always had a plan before I did anything, like an RGB mod. I would always go pick the TV, and then I'd do as much information on TV. So another thing was, if I couldn't find like a manual or a sir, I just wouldn't bother with the TV, at least not first. Uh, if you can't find the service manual, then it's not a good idea to try to go and jump into that, because what you want to do is find a TV and then get the service manual for it, and when you start working into the television then you can kind of get in there and look at the service manual and it will help you learn what the language in there and how, how it works out into the machine so you can understand what on paper is trying to be told to you in the machine form and then you go look at it in practical application in the machine so you've got to get familiarize yourself with manuals as far as like uh, basic electronic stuff Honestly, just get on Google and start looking up for like community college basic electronics classes. There are a couple of good just professors out there that really sat there and recorded their lectures from community colleges. I've watched a few of those uh, when I was new to electronics to try to understand. Now, I do have an engineering background in my education, 
And then um, the first few years of out of college, the job I had was in the construction field, specifically concrete and engineering in that field. But that was a long time ago, and I'm not there anymore. But you do, um, you will end up coming to points where you need to know some mathematics, and just just the best thing to do is not go full gung ho into something. Just take kind of baby steps. And, and you'll learn as you go. I had no idea how to read schematics when I started, and now I know completely what I'm looking at when I see basically a blueprint for a television chassis and um, other things inside the board. So that's a great question. I may get into it some more in the future, but for today, that's just kind of the way I would recommend it. You know, go on there and study online like you keep doing, and then start working your way into practice, okay? Just go from there into practice, start on lower end stuff, pick up a consumer CRT and say, okay, my goal is to learn everything about this consumer CRT and then I want to take it apart and then I want to replace all the decent or all the um, larger, older capacitors in it. So you can go through and do this, basically make a checklist of how to remove caps and and so you can go through that yourself and then after you get done with that project, you fire it up and it's a really great feeling of knowing you completed it. You do that, and then you can take a step. Hey, all right, this time next time I want to RGB mod the TV, or this time I want to get a PVM that's broken and try to fix it. Uh, so that's just some of my advice. Let's go to the next question. Okay, next question is from John Gerard, and John was asking where I get my cap kits from. Again, I've talked about this a little bit before. The cap kits all come from. Uh, Ma I use Mouser, but you can use DigiKey, any parts supplier for electronics parts. And again, to make my cap kits, I have to make my own cap kits. So if you're a patron and you have a model of a monitor and you want a cap kit, you know, just hit me up with a message. If I've got it, I'll, I'll give it to you. But otherwise, you have to go through and just pull the chassis out, look at the caps on there, and the best thing to do, I feel like, is to go through and individually look at them all. Now, you could go through the manual, too, if you want to, and just read the caps on the parts list and order them from there and then you kind of map where it was what parts and it will tell you on the manual so you can go in there and get lists usually too of the caps but I like to go through and just pick out which ones I'm gonna replace and make sure I double it gives me a way to double check them okay the next thing is not really so much a question it's a little bit of discussion I have with Nigel and this is about the VCR video that was done about two or three weeks ago and we were talking a little bit about comb filters and I was trying to figure out, you know, he was talking about the comb filter on the BVM and how it was helping the picture image when he could use it. And I figured out that with that VCR, it's not actually adding a comb filter to anything when you're playing it straight like a video. The only thing it's combing is if I add something into the VCR and then have it output through the VCR. So that would be like if cable was coming into it or if I was using one of the inputs as like composite or S-video and then for example taping something then that could add the comb filter so the comb filter is not on there and it's not something you control it's not like a filter it's just going to add uh, something good to current videos it's for when you're throwing a signal through the VCR U 53R and he has says good que good video I got a question what do the plastic wheel dials on the yoke do? This is about the yoke assembly video and you'll notice there are some wheels and adjustments on the yoke but I've tried to go through there and even make an adjust there's th those wheels don't move at all they're they have some of the hardest epoxy and I'm afraid that I would break it if I actually did try to make an adjustment so I have to feel like that's doing something like maybe putting tension on those magnetic uh, coils those copper lines but I'm I'm not honestly sure so if anybody else knows and wants to answer that question please do so below that would be my guess and then it's set in the factory and they're like, don't let it get out of this setting because it's too important. That's probably why they put that hard epoxy on there. Okay, and I've got another question here from Nicholas Galvin. Uh, yes, your videos are awesome, very informative. I was able to get to the menu to adjust some of my settings and I was watching your other videos. Um, I do feel that I might need to replace caps in the pin area. I have never discharged a CRT before and it kind of scares me. I live by myself. Can I replace the caps with the board still attached? Well, you probably could, but honestly, it's so hard to do. If you try to replace the caps, it's it's um, it's really difficult. You could do it, though. I mean, if you wanted to work around the... If you could get to it, 
on your monitor if you can get to that point on the board but a lot of times on PVMs that boards at the bottom so you have to actually pull it out to get to the caps and I don't really recommend it I know it's a scary thing to first time discharge a monitor but you've seen me do it so many times and honestly I've never had any troubles discharging you just do it like we I've done it a hundred times and you'll never have any problems and just do it and break it down that way you know have you, you don't have to worry about anything after it's discharged if you're concerned about discharging and you live alone here's what you do unplug the monitor let it sit there for a day or two with the power button still pushed in and just let it sit there and odds are all the electricity is going to be drained out of it by then and whatever's left again is just going to be stored inside that tube glass and there's that little metal point where the anode cap is so get in there and discharge it I really think you should just go for it I know it's kind of nervous living by yourself and um, maybe you know call somebody and, and have them on the phone with you while you're doing it and make sure that if something does happen like hey call for me if I don't answer uh, call the police or something so anyway stay safe for sure but it's not it's it's more about our fear when we're working on CRTs there's a lot more fear involved than actual danger okay so the next question came from Caillou's dad and he asked to locate the uh, or is it possible to locate RGB and blanking pins on a jungle I see without the service manual uh, no schematics available on the set but he wants to do a specific TV like the best thing you can do is try to find those manuals and try to find the jungle chip breakdown if you can't you know you can find easily which one of the chips there should only be two at the most three on there that are pretty decent sized chips you can still find the part number on the top of that chip and then google that and try to find uh, either a, another chip that is the same and has the pinout listed there or maybe you'll find the pinout for that TV now look occasionally you are gonna have to pay for the manuals from those pay sites I know it sucks but I've had to do it before because they're sometimes the only ones that are gonna have manuals for some of this old equipment now I'm down to the final question it comes from Shane and he wanted to know about how to record uh, CRT footage without getting screen flicker and so I figured I would just have the game plan. I played a little bit and I could show you that and talk about it. So the best way is to first have your camera set up properly and that means your shutter speed needs to be in a multiple of 60. So you can put it on 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second. I tend to go for 30. Just happens to work better on my Nikon. Then you're going to need to uh, make sure you got a dark room so you don't have any glare against your screen. And then it always seems to help to have some kind of backlight behind the TV. It could be something simple as a lamp. And uh, just make sure you got some backlight behind the TV. It actually helps. I'm not sure what the, really the reason is, but it does tend to help have a better picture. All right, so that's all the questions for this first round for this month. And I do have about another 10 questions from the rest of the videos that I've not gotten to in this Q&A and I'll do that in the next Q&A so that video will come out in, within a week but again I just want to say a super big thank you to anybody who asked a question and also to anybody who's subscribing and watching the content regularly it really helps me I appreciate it uh, please let me know if you have any comments or any more questions before I film that and I can possibly answer your question on the next Q&A once again, thank you for watching. I'm Steve with Retro Tech, and have a wonderful day.